or are giving him the information he needs so that Trump can say what he wants to say. Although, you know, what's even worse than what Trump is saying is what his son is saying, right? Donald Trump Jr. I mean, the apple really doesn't fall far from the tree when it comes to BSing about the economy. Listen to this tweet that Donald Trump Jr. tweeted out today about the GDP. Incredible numbers. I remember when the experts laughed about breaking 3%. Just because Obama never broke 2% doesn't mean that someone with great policies can't. Let's keep this going. Okay, first of all, Obama broke 2% on many occasions. I mean, we're talking, there were plenty of years where the GDP went grew by more than 2% over Obama, let alone quarters. I mean, most of Obama's quarters were probably above 2%. I mean, many were not, uh, but many were above. And again, this is one quarter. We don't have 4% growth for the year. We have 4.1% for one quarter. You know, Obama had two quarters of economic growth during his presidency that were higher than 4.1. Uh, and so, so how can Donald Trump Jr. say this was never done by Obama? Obama had two quarters that were better than the quarter that his father just had, right? And Obama had plenty of quarters that were over 2%. What is he talking about? Obama never broke 2%. I mean, is this guy not even bothered to check any of the facts? He just tweets stuff out there? I mean, his dad, in many cases, does the same thing. But this is all part of the hype, all part of the hysteria. In fact, you know, one of the other things that they did today when they reported the numbers, they actually went back and reported that the GDP numbers for the last, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years were wrong. And they went back and they redid them. And all of a sudden they said the U.S. economy is like a trillion dollars bigger than they thought. So now instead of having, you know, a $19 trillion economy, we have a $20 trillion economy, like all of a sudden. And they also went back and they said the savings rate is twice what we thought it was. We thought it was about 3.5%, and it's really about 7% because we didn't accurately measure all the profits that small business owners were, were er earning and hoarding up on. Like they're, they're making all this money and they're stocking it away, and we forgot to count it. And so the savings rate is really twice what we thought, and the economy is bigger than we thought, so there's nothing to worry about. I mean, like, who's going to believe these numbers? First of all, the government is saying, look, we've been wrong for all these years, but now we're right. Well, what if they were right for all those years and they're wrong now? Or what if they were wrong in the past and they're still wrong? I think it's probably more likely that they were overestimating the size of the economy before, and now they're overestimating it by an even larger number. Maybe the savings rate is even smaller than they originally reported. Because if they're going to keep changing the numbers, then what confidence do we have that they're ever accurate? If they could be so off in the past, then how do we know they're not off now? And of course, the government has a vested interest in putting out BS numbers on the economy. First of all, the larger they can pretend the economy is, the more sustainable the debt looks, right? Because we always want to look at debt relative to GDP. Now, our debt is over 21 trillion, the bonded debt. Well, so if the economy is 20 trillion rather than 19 trillion, I guess the debt to GDP is not as horrible. I mean, it's still more debt than GDP, but the idea is to make the creditors feel a little bit more secure by exaggerating the size of the economy. And sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we have less savings, but if people think we have more savings and maybe people think, oh, the economy can keep going because people still have more savings that they can spend when that is not the case. In fact, another reason that I think that the GDP numbers were actually artificially enhanced in the quarter, there was about a 4% jump in consumer spending. That was the strongest part of the quarter was consumer spending. Now, I think the reason that consumers are spending more money is because the stuff they're buying is more expensive. It, you know, a lot of it is higher gas prices, but prices are going up. It's just not being reflected in the GDP because the deflator doesn't capture it because the deflator is deliberately underreported. So I think this is not more consumer spending. I think this is just consumer spending more but not necessarily buy more. You know, I just came back from a trip to uh, to California. And just a couple of indications of higher prices. So the last time I was at my Newport Beach office, parking was free. I came to go to my office this time, and all of a sudden now there's, there's a machine there, and I got to pay to park in the guest parking lot. It used to be free. It's now $15 uh, to park. 
you know, whereas, you know, last year it was free. They told me they just put uh, that in. I guess a new owner bought the building and he just put that in in the last couple of months. Um, and so all of a sudden, you know, I got to pay $15 or anybody has to pay $15 for something uh, that was free. You know, there's no, you know, no humans there. It's just a machine and you got to put your credit card in. You know, also, I was traveling on the toll roads. They just jacked the price up on the toll roads last month. Again, who knows how many times. It's a lot more expensive than I remember it being. But, you know, the last time I drove on these toll roads, there was actually a human being there. I was in a rental car. And so when I go through, I can't pay cash because they no longer have the option of paying cash. So you just have to pay on your rental car. Uh, and the rental car company has, a, has an automated thing in the car. But in addition to the cost of the toll, which went up, the rental company adds six bucks to the toll for every time you go through it for a process and handling fee. So in the past, I could have just paid cash. I could have given the, the toll guy cash. But, you know, based on minimum wage laws, they probably fired all the toll keepers. Uh, but they keep raising the price of the toll. But now it's even more expensive because since you can't pay cash, you have to run the thing through your rental car company and they charge you a premium. I mean, prices are going up all over the place, right? And so that is what's going on. And that is why consumers are spending more, but it's not real economic growth. Although probably one of the most BS claims that Trump made in his press conference today, where he was, you know, taking credit for this booming economy that's so sustainable, he talked about the $50 billion drop in the trade deficit. And he said it's all because of the tariffs. Now, first of all, I mean, what is he talking about? The trade deficit hasn't dropped by 50 billion. Now, quarter over quarter, I think it's down, mainly based on what just happened uh, with uh, the soybeans and the exports. But I mean, that's because of the trade tariffs, but for the wrong reasons. It's because people are trying to trade quickly before the tariffs kick in. It's not the tariffs that are doing it. I mean, in a way they're doing it, but for the opposite reason that, that Trump believes. But still, it's not a $50 billion drop. I mean, I don't know where he's getting this number. I mean, is he annualizing the number uh, or taking the month? I don't, I don't know where this number is coming from. But if you look at the trade deficits for the months that Trump has been in office, I'm not really sure how many it is, a year and a half, however many months, and then you take the exact same number of months from before he was in office, so the last uh, a comparable period under under Obama, the trade deficits have been bigger under Trump, even with the recent improvement than they were under Obama. And by the way, we got the June trade deficit uh, this week, and it was a big jump. It was a 5% increase over the prior month. So we're already going back the other way. So this is completely disingenuous for Trump to be claiming credit for a big drop in the trade deficit when the trade deficits are bigger now than they were before he was elected. Same thing when he keeps talking about job creation. If you take the number of months that Trump has been president and compare them to the same number of months at the end of the Obama presidency, more jobs were being created under Obama than are currently been created under Trump. Yet it doesn't stop everybody from coming out there talking about this is an unprecedented period of economic prosperity. Donald Trump got elected because he called out all the BS. He said, Obama has been lying to you about the economy, Wall Street, the media, everybody is telling you the economy is great, and you know and I know that it's lousy. You're being fed a bunch of lies from these career politicians. The economy is a disaster. It's an economic wasteland. So send me to Washington and I'm going to fix it. The economy is basically exactly the same as it was before he was elected, and now he's doing the same thing. The economy is great. Everything is booming. He is opening up the door to not only being a hypocrite, but when the Democrats run against him in 2020, they'll be able to use the same strategy because the economy is going to be worse. The average voter is going to be in worse economic shape than he was the day he voted for Trump, if he voted for Trump. And they're going to be able to say, hey, Trump has been lying to you. He's not being honest. He's, you know, he's feeding you a bunch of lies about the economy, right? It worked to get Trump elected, so it will work to get uh, uh, his challenger elected. You know, also, Trump was just blaming all of our problems, right? The hollowing out of American industry, uh, the loss of good paying jobs, all of it he was blaming on foreigners, right? It's all foreigners' fault. It's all because of these horrible trade deals that existed before me. And, you know, now that I'm president, I'm going to fix all these bad deals. This is a bunch of nonsense. 
We, America, we are responsible for the hollowing out of our industry. We are the responsible for the destruction of these jobs. It's not foreigners doing these things to us, just like Trump wants to blame things on immigrants, right? Oh, it's the, we're losing our jobs because of illegal immigrants, so let's build a wall. Oh, we're losing our jobs because of bad trade deals, so let's erect some tariffs. None of this is true. I mean, this scapegoating sometimes works, right? The people can rally around it in this false sense of patriotism, but it's a bunch of nonsense. Look, if you look at the average tariffs in the world, I mean, they're only about 2%. I mean, some of on some goods, they're higher. On some goods, they're lower. But if you average all the goods, it's 2%. It's not that big a deal. You know, the U.S. averages 1.6%. For all the talk about China, oh, these horrific high tariffs in China. Before the trade war started, right, U.S. was at 1.6% average. China was 3.5. All right, so 3.5 is higher than 1.6, but come on. That's not the reason that we've lost all of our jobs. In fact, Trump was calling out Canada for its protectionism. The average tariff in Canada was 0.8. So American tariffs averaged twice as much as Canadian tariffs. You didn't, you didn't see Canada coming down and threatening more tariffs on the U.S. for all their unfair trade deals. I mean, we have more tariffs than Canada on average. So this is all nonsense. It's not because of other countries not playing fair. It's because of our own tax policy, our own regulatory policy, our own monetary policy, regulations, all this stuff. And Trump is doing very little to address those problems. Yes, there's been some deregulation. There's been a reduction in the pace of new regulation. That's probably been the biggest accomplishment of Trump, that he hasn't kept adding new regulations, right, the way we were before. But what we really need to do is get rid of a lot of regulations. See, he wants to claim credit, like, oh, he claimed credit for getting rid of Obamacare. He didn't get rid of Obamacare. He just got rid of some of the funding for Obamacare. All the expenses are still there. Obamacare is going to cost more than ever before because of the way Trump tinkered with it. And of course, now he's going to get the blame for it. And yes, Trump cut taxes, but made government more expensive in other ways by increasing welfare spending, increasing military spending. In fact, the other uh, economic number that we got this week that showed how the economy was doing was the durable goods orders, which had fallen for two straight months. And they were supposed to rise by 3%, I think. Instead, they rose by about 1% or 1%. So one third of what was expected. But the only reason that they weren't down for a third straight month was because military spending rose by 20% month over month. This is not economic growth. This, this is bigger government. Spending more money on the military, that's not going to improve our standard of living because we built more you know, war machines. Uh, and of course, where's the money coming from to buy this military equipment? It's being borrowed, right? We're going to have to pay interest on it. So th this whole press conference, I think, is going to backfire the scapegoating, the claiming credit for victories that have not been won is going to come back to bite not only the president, but all the Republicans who are trying to run on his coattails, you know, all the never Trumpers who are now worshiping Trump because they believe all this nonsense. And yes, Trump's popularity among Republicans has risen because all the hype, right? I mean, that's the whole idea. Just repeat a lie loud enough and often enough and get enough people to say it. And all of a sudden, everybody's going to believe that we have this booming economy. But it's not booming. You know, the stock market was booming, but who knows how much longer it's going to continue to boom. In fact, look at what happened this week that would suggest that the stock market's going a lot lower. So the momentum stocks is what everybody's been buying. The FANG stocks, right? Facebook, um, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Well, look what happened to Facebook this week. Yesterday, Facebook stock was down 19% in one day. One day. Down again today, so 20%, over 20% in two days on Facebook because they missed earnings, right? And we already had Netflix uh, that missed earnings too. So that the N uh, already started to fall, and now you have the F uh, that's collapsing. But look what happened today. Some of these huge stocks, um, Twitter, which is not part of the FANG, but Twitter was down 20% today in one day, 20%, boom because they missed earnings. But it's not just, you know, these little stocks. Look at Intel, which is also part of the Dow now. Intel today down 8.6% in one day. 
In fact, if you look at what's happened, and I pointed this out on my last podcast, you're seeing a huge shift right now from the momentum stocks to the value stocks, from the stocks that are about growth to the stocks that are out being defensive in a portfolio. That is what's going on. And this is probably the beginning of a major trend in change in trend, which is also going to be the beginning of the bear market or accelerating the bear market in U.S. stocks because everybody owns uh, all these momentum stocks. I mean, these momentum stocks are what dominate all the indexes. So if you're in an index, you're in these momentum stocks. And when these momentum stocks really start to get killed, then the indexes are going to get killed. In fact, if you look at the drop in the Dow today, not that bad. It was down 76 points, right? 0.3%. But then look at the NASDAQ composite down 114 points, 1.46%. And it's worse when you go to the Russell 2000, these small cap stocks, which is, oh, these are real growth, right? Everybody was saying, oh, let's hide out in these small cap stocks because they're not going to be impacted by the trade war. They were down 1.9%. They were down even more. And this trend, I think, is going to continue. And so Trump is not only is he going to lose all the hype about the economy, Right as the, the 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 future GDP numbers really start to f- collapse, but the stock market is going to go down with it, and everything that he has been taking credit for is now going to be something that he's going to be blamed for, and he's not going to get out uh, from under it. You know, another thing too that we got this week, which was a bunch of hype, was on uh, the European trade deal. I mean, Trump is out there. We have a deal. This is great. Another press conference. I've got this great deal with Europe. You know, as if. Anything has been accomplished, right? He wants to pretend that his big threats of tariffs on automobiles, you know, brought the Europeans to their knees and they used to be our foes. But now, thanks to him, we're all buddy, buddy. Everybody is friends because we've got this great deal. We don't have a deal. We've got nothing. Look at the deal. What they agreed to do is try to come to an agreement in the future, right? What they said is they're going to, the goal is to have no tariffs. The goal is to have no non-monetary tariffs, right? I mean, sure. I mean, yeah, that's a goal. Yeah, I could say my goal is to marry a supermodel, right? I mean, I'll, well, I'm already married, but let's say I wasn't. I could have a goal of marrying a supermodel. Yeah, sure, everybody can have that goal. That, does that mean that you're going to achieve that goal just because you have it? I mean, just because they have a goal of having no tariffs, there is no chance that they're going to achieve that. Now, would it be great? Yes, it would be better to have no tariffs, right? They're not high right now. And again, there are plenty of non-tariff barriers, you know, that would be great if we got rid of them. Yeah, I would love it if I can fly on a, on a foreign airplane. I would love it if I can fly from New York to L.A. on Cathay Pacific, on Singapore Airlines, on Air New Zealand, right? It's illegal. I'm not allowed to do it, right? If they abandoned that, if they got rid of those laws, yeah, I would like to be able to fly those planes. It would make, you know, so would a lot of Americans. It would bring down the cost of traveling coast to coast. But to protect the U.S. airline industry... The U.S. government doesn't allow foreign airlines to compete in the domestic market, right? That's a non-tariff barrier. Let's get rid of it, right? And and personally, if Trump really cared, right, the best thing that you can do is just get rid of all your tariffs. You're, unilaterally, it doesn't matter what anybody else does, because your economy will be more efficient if you don't have tariffs. Now, I understand governments need revenue. And so if we're going to raise revenue using tariffs instead of income taxes, well, that could be a positive trade-off. But if you're just imposing tariffs to protect certain industries, you're actually making your economy less competitive. You're hurting other industries more than you're helping the ones that you're protecting, and you're overall reducing your standard of living. So the reality is, no matter how stupid the other country is, the best thing for you to do is have no tariffs. And if other countries want to hurt their own economies by imposing tariffs, let them do it. Right? But here is the political reality. Tariffs exist not because they are good economics. Tariffs exist because they are good politics, right? If you go back to the framers, they warned us about the danger of factions, political factions, which is why they created America as a republic and not a democracy to protect us from factions. See, factions are special interest groups, right? And tariffs are there to protect or benefit special interest groups. And the reason that they're effective politically is because the groups that benefit from the tariffs are highly organized and they can directly see the benefit. Let's say farmers, right? You put a subsidy on farmers. Let's say we have, you know, tariffs on sugar. 
so that Americans have to pay, I don't know, 50 percent more or whatever it is than, than the rest of the world pays for sugar because we want to protect our sugar farmers. So we keep out the foreign sugar or we make sure there's a big tariff so that American sugar farmers can earn more money. Now, the sugar farmers love it. They make a lot of money and they can vote for the politicians that provide those subsidies. They can give political donations to the politicians who supply those subsidies because they all know who they are. Right. It's a it's a it's a group that is organized, this farming lobby, and the benefits are, you know, easy to see. Right. Oh, I get to sell my sugar for a big price. Now, the fact that every American consumer pays a little bit more for sugar. I mean, in the scheme of things, what is it? A few a few cents here, a few cents there. I mean, nobody's going to complain. Nobody's going to organize a big grassroots effort to reduce the price of sugar, even though it makes, the you know, every can of soda a little bit more expensive. I mean, the, the benefits of getting rid of the uh, sugar subsidies or tariffs would be basically widespread throughout the entire country. There is no one small group of organized people that benefit. Yet you have this organized group of sugar producers that clearly benefit and have a lot to lose. And therefore, they're willing to give a lot of money to politicians who will support this subsidy. Well, this is what's happening in Europe. This is what's happening in Japan. We don't have a monopoly on stupid uh, politicians or they're not actually stupid. They're acting in their own self-interest. They're trying to secure their own reelection and they're willing to sacrifice the country. So it's really not that they're stupid. They just have no p morals. They have no principle. They have no integrity. They just care about themselves. And that's true all over the world. Right. I mean, your Euro European politicians and Asian politicians, they're no better than American politicians. Right. They're all the lowest. You know, we're, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel when we're talking about our elected officials here. And so the idea that we're going to get rid of our tariffs is nonsense. The Europeans aren't going to do it. We're not going to do it, you know, because nobody wants to anger the special interest groups that keep them in power. So this agreement to eventually come to an agreement is much ado about nothing. But all it lets Trump do is pretend that he accomplished something. Now, maybe he doesn't have to impose these extra tariffs. And he can claim that he created, he got some kind of win. We won one. We didn't win anything. The only thing we won is that he didn't impose the tariffs that he was threatening to impose. But basically, he saved us from his own threat. It's like he said, I'm going to I'm going to beat you on the head. And then he decided not to beat us on the head and says, oh, you should thank me because you didn't get hit in the head. Finally, I got to finish up this podcast talking about Bitcoin. I haven't, I, I meant to actually talk about it on my last podcast and it slipped my mind. So I'm going to talk about it on this podcast. So we had had a pretty big rally in Bitcoin. You know, it got down below 6,000, 5,800 or so. And all of a sudden it had this big rally. And I think the highest I saw it get up to was about 8,500, maybe 8,600. Not sure exactly uh, what the peak was. But I think the catalyst for the rally, other than some speculators coming in and, you know, trying to buy what could have been a support, because, uh, you know, we've had a lot of support around the 6,000 level. So I think some speculative money came in to try to trade into the market. But I think the catalyst to move up, you know, certainly above 8,000 was the anticipation of a Bitcoin ETF. You know, the Winklevi twins had tried once before to get their ETF approved. And there were some rumors that they might succeed this second time around. And so I think there was a lot of buying. But one of the things I noticed was that a lot of the buying wasn't coming from new money necessarily moving into the Bitcoin market or the crypto market. It was people who already own cryptos. They own some altcoins and they were moving their chips from the altcoins to Bitcoin, trying to front run the launching of the ETF so that they can have more Bitcoins. Because after all, it was a Bitcoin ETF. The ETF did not evolve any of the other cryptocurrencies, it was just Bitcoin. And I saw that Bitcoin's percentage of total market cap rose to a new high for the year. I mean, it got up above 47.5%. Uh, and so there was a lot of speculation. But I thought that, look, even if the the uh, the ETFs got approved, that it could end up being a buy the rumor, sell the fact. Uh, because once it was approved, you know, there could be traders looking to sell into it. But in any event, the... ETF did not get approved. The SEC did the right thing, in my opinion, because there's no reason to have a, a Bitcoin ETF. And they they turned it down. And Bitcoin sold off, but not that much. I mean, it got down around 7,800 uh, as a result. And as I'm recording this, it's back above 8,200. And I think one of the reasons it rose today is one of the people at the SEC, a woman, I forget her name, 
published her own like opinion where she disagreed with the, the majority. And she said, hey, I think it was wrong. I think that we shouldn't have an ETF for Bitcoin. And I think that maybe emboldened some of the speculators to think, oh, OK, well, maybe the Winklevi ETF didn't get approved. But there are some others waiting in the wings, maybe by some companies that have more experience with ETFs in the past. And the thinking may be, well, we're going to get an ETF, just not right now. It's going to be a different ETF, and people want to speculate there. But I want to talk a little bit about an ETF, because there is no reason. I mean, an ETF for Bitcoin is all about pure speculation on Bitcoin. It's got nothing to do with Bitcoin being used as a medium of exchange, being used as a currency. Because when Bitcoin is in an ETF, by definition, it's not being used as a currency. You can't spend it. It's in your ETF, right? Uh, so you're not holding it as a currency. You're just buying it to gamble on price appreciation. But what is all the price appreciation gambling on? It's a bet that people will eventually use it as money. But the people who are buying it in an in a ETF are not buying it to use it as money. They're buying it to speculate that in the future, somebody else is going to use it as money. Well, meanwhile, that's what everybody is doing. Everybody is buying it to speculate that somebody in the future will use it as money, but no one in the present is actually using it as money because it doesn't work well as money. But people are speculating that things are going to change, that if the price just goes high enough and everybody just buys it, that the price will magically stabilize, all the volatility will go away, and then we'll be able to use it as money. But in the meantime, we're just going to speculate that one day it's going to be money. And that's all an ETF would do, is allow people to speculate. Now, maybe it's an easy way for some of the people who own a bunch of Bitcoin to get out, right, to sell it into an ETF. So it's a, hey, let's pump it up so we can dump uh, all of our Bitcoins into some ETF. And I think that might be one of the reasons that the regulators don't want to approve it. I mean, why do they want to approve an exit strategy for Bitcoin insiders so that innocent investors can buy these things in their IRAs? Because that's basically all that's going to be accomplished if you have Bitcoin ETFs. Because anybody who wants to buy Bitcoin, they can just go out and buy it right now, right? There's nothing stopping anybody from buying Bitcoin, right? Just go out and buy it. I mean, there's no storage fees. It's easy to do. Right to actually buy it, spending them, that's a, that's a hard part. But just buying them, oh yeah, you can buy them, it's easy. Uh, and there's no storage costs involved. So why do you need an ETF? You know, the reason that people use ETFs is to buy things that are difficult to buy and that have storage costs. Let's say gold, right? Why do, why do some people want to buy gold ETFs? Because they don't want to go to a gold dealer like Shift Gold. They don't want to buy some physical gold and have to have it shipped to them you know, UPS or post office, and then they don't, they don't want to have to worry about where they're going to store it, where, how they, you know, if they're going to put it in a bank at a safety deposit box, they're going to have to pay the cost of the box. And then if they need to sell it, they got to go back down to the bank, get the gold. They got to ship it back to the dealer, you know, wait for the money to come, right? So it's easier uh, to buy gold for people in an ETF. Now, companies like Gold Money have made it very easy to buy gold. So a lot of people who might have bought gold in an ETF because they thought it was easier, I think it's actually easier to just open up a gold money account and buy your gold that way. But, you know, if you want to buy gold in an IRA as part of a portfolio, right, if you want to buy gold in a, in a pension where you need a custodian, the ETFs made it easier for people to do that. Now, you can still shift gold. You can buy gold and in your IRA, but it's more complicated uh, and more expensive than just buying an ETF in your, your Pacific Capital brokerage account. And so that's really all that you would accomplish with an ETF for Bitcoin is that you would enable people to buy it more easily in their retirement accounts or their IRAs. But nobody should be speculating on Bitcoin. I mean, this is probably the riskiest investment you could make. Probably even the people who think it may go to a million will acknowledge it could also go to zero. And why would you want to buy something that can go to zero in your IRA? I mean, you can't, you don't get a tax loss for that. Um, so I think that if you think you have a high probability of the investment going to zero, the last place you'd want to buy it is in your retirement account. So if you're going to gamble, you should do it in with your taxable money where you can at least, uh, you know, you utilize the tax loss and you're not, you know, gambling your retirement nest egg. You know, the other things too about ETFs is they have other purposes. Let's say stock ETFs, right? The idea is to have a whole diversified portfolio in a single security. So I can buy one symbol and get maybe 20, 30, 50 different stocks, or I can buy an entire market. They have ETFs that, 
you know, focus on particular countries. So you get all this diversification in a particular sector. They don't have single stock ETFs. It's not like I buy an ETF to buy, you know, Microsoft. If I want to buy Microsoft, I just buy Microsoft. Why buy a Microsoft ETF? Because a Microsoft ETF is just going to add costs. I mean, maybe if they were talking about an ETF with the top 10 cryptocurrencies or the top 20 cryptocurrencies, you could make an argument that, hey, it's an easy way to diversify in a basket of cryptos. But to have an ETF for just Bitcoin, when I can just go out and buy Bitcoin, and of course, the ETF adds another level of cost. They have to charge you to run it. So what, just buy it. There's no cost. It makes no sense. You're not saving anything. When you buy a gold ETF, okay, you don't have to store the gold yourself. But you still have to pay for the ETF to store it. You're paying an ETF for Bitcoin to do absolutely nothing. Now, they do have single currency ETFs. You can buy an ETF of the euro. You can buy an ETF of the yen. But the reason for that is, you know, most people, let's say you want to buy euros because you think they're going to go up. How are you going to buy them? You're going to go down to the bank. You go to the Bank of America and buy a bunch of euros. They charge a fortune. They can charge you 5%. I mean, it's no big deal if you're going on a vacation and you want $500 worth of euros to have cash. But if you want to buy 10,000, 50, 100,000 worth, a million dollars worth, because you think the price is going up, you're not going to go grab the, the cash out of a bank and then, you know, bear, you know, put it under your mattress or get a huge safety deposit box to stack the, the euro notes in. Obviously, there, for most people, if they don't want to have a commodity futures account and deal with that, these single currency ETFs are a more convenient, uh, less caustic, you know, less, cheaper way to speculate on currencies if that's what you want to do. But if you want to speculate on Bitcoin, if you want to buy $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, go do it. It's cheaper to do it directly than to do it through some ETF that they're about to establish. So there is absolutely no reason for a, a Bitcoin ETF other than to create more speculative demand for Bitcoin to keep the price going up so the people who already own it can get out. And hopefully the SEC will be smart enough not to help facilitate this Ponzi scheme and help make it easier for people who want to unload their Bitcoin to do it because they make it easier for the mom and pops out there. I mean, they want to talk about the institutions. Oh, we want to make it easier for institutions. Look, the institutions can buy all the Bitcoin they want. They don't need to do it in an ETF, right? I mean, there may be some pensions or some funds that are limited that they, you know, they can't do private equity or, you know, they, they, they have to buy something that's traded. But look, all the hedge funds, any hedge fund that wants to buy Bitcoin, they don't need the ETF. They can all load up on it right now, no problem, right? So all the hedge funds that want to gamble are already there, right? So some of them are hoping that they can drag in some additional suckers uh, so that they get, can have somebody else left holding the bag. Again, hopefully uh, all these uh, ETFs will be turned down. And my guess is that they will because there's no valid purpose for them other than this uh, pump and dump. And I think that once they get turned down, uh, you're going to see a bigger uh, buy not only buy the rumor, sell the fact, but buy the rumor and sell because the, the fact doesn't live up to the rumor because the rumors never come true. Meanwhile, just because we rallied off those lows, right? Everybody is out there hyping this. Oh, this is great. Bitcoin's going back to 20,000, 25,000, 50,000, 100,000. This is what happens every time it rallies. We are in a bear market. I think we're going to continue to be in a bear market in cryptocurrencies. You know, one thing that pissed me off is that guy I've talked about, this guy, Brian Kelly, who's the biggest pumper on CNBC Fast Money. In the, the few days leading up to the move above 8,000, Brian Kelly was on CNBC every day. Buy it. This is great. This is huge. This is a big breakout. We're going up. We're going back to 20,000. He was like really, really optimistic. And then all of a sudden, he's like, well, I'm a little bit cautious. You know, I think that we're probably not going to get the ETF. You know, by the way, I traded out of it the other day. I took profits. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. He didn't say anything about his intention to take profits when he was touting uh, everybody to buy, when he was encouraging all of the CNBC audience to go buy Bitcoin. He didn't say that, hey, I'm about to trade out of it. If you guys push it up, I'm going to use it as an opportunity to unload uh, some of my Bitcoins. And I think that's very disingenuous. And that's a, a, a nice way of putting it. To me, it was like a pump and dump. I think CNBC ought to police this. Because when they have somebody who manages a Bitcoin fund, who is on their air every day 
touting Bitcoin, how great it is. They know how thin the market is, where he can go on television and tout it, tout it, tout it, and then dump it. I mean, remember how they had a huge pump on Bitcoin cash. I remember when that thing started to move up. I mean, they were, oh, you got to buy, you got to buy this to break out, buy Bitcoin cash. Then the price imploded. You know, so they're giving these guys a soapbox to come on television daily where you have an illiquid market, where, where what they say can influence the market, and then they just sell into it. You know, now maybe because it's not regulated. I mean, if this was a stock, it would probably be illegal and they would make them disclose it. Well, I think they should do a better job of self-policing what's going on because they won't let me on the air, right? I can't go on CNBC anymore. Fast Money won't have me on because I'm negative.